Okay, so here we go. We've got a nice lecture on the American Revolution. And I just want to start off by saying that this lecture is not designed to give you every single battle of the American Revolution, or really to give you every single detail of the American Revolution. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to take this from a, a region's perspective. And so we want to when you hit the highlights. I want to talk to you about causes. I want to talk to you about effects. We'll get some highlights of, of battles and, and, and things you should be aware of throughout the American Revolution. But ultimately, this is a place to start, maybe not a place to end. And so for the American Revolution, to help you understand it, we'll start out with some big ideas. We'll address where this thing starts, and we'll fill in the gaps along the way. I'll talk a little bit about Benedict Arnold, and uh, let's do this, guys. So some big ideas to start off with. I teach global studies as well, and part of global studies, you must talk about the French Revolution, right? And the French Revolution is a lot more radical than the American Revolution. There's this bloodshed through the, the reign of terror with guys like Maximilien Robespierre, and so the American Revolution doesn't have that. We'll talk about some of the things that Sons of Liberty do, and some people may consider them to be a quasi-terrorist organization, right? But it is clearly not in the same way that the Jacobins did business by cutting people's heads off in the streets with, you know, the guillotine. So from a beginning to end perspective, the people that want the revolution are the merchant class, the people who have land, right? People who are a little bit more wealthier in America and want to stay wealthy. And those same people are going to be writing the Declaration of Con uh, of independence and eventually writing the Articles of Confederation. And in those those documents we're talking about here is is rights and liberty and, and they're really nice things to strive for. But no one would argue that after the American Revolution we actually have true equality or that the masses, the, the poor, have their voices fully heard or that men and women are equal. That's That's not what happened. Okay, so we do get some changes. But I don't want you thinking that America is totally perfect after the revolution. That is, that is clearly not what happens. All right. So we've got landowners. We've got slave owners. We've got merchants, right? Thomas Jefferson owning slaves. It's a pretty well-known fact, okay? Generally wealthy people are going to be leading this revolution. And coming out of it, those wealthy people are going to stay in government and they're going to hold on to the government via uh, property requirements for, for voting or the fact that you had to be a man or the fact that you could not be a black person and, and vote, right? So understanding these things will help you to maybe challenge yourself to say, okay, you know, the American Revolution, right, it's a revolution, but, but how much of it really, really changed? Certainly there's not going to be a king. We'll replace it with a representative democracy, and I, I guess we'll talk about that towards the end. So influences, because you know I don't want you to I don't want you to think that I'm, I'm painting this as as a revolution where where nothing happens, right? There are some really really interesting influences that get things started, and one of the guys pictured there is Thomas Paine, and Thomas Paine writes his book called Common Sense, and basically what he's saying is that. The common people, right, the colonists, or, or as we'll call Americans, should rise together and have a government that represents them. You see, one of the features of British rule was that they had a parliament over in Britain, but the Americans were not represented in that parliament. And so when parliament passed laws, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, democratically elected parliament, right? but it's not elected by the colonists. And so the colonists feel like their voices are not heard in that parliament in Britain. And Thomas Paine says, you know, it's, it's common sense for us to have a voice. It's common sense for us to have a government. And guys, it's common sense that our, our rulers are all the way across that ocean. How can they possibly understand what we need as a people, right? How can they understand our day-to-day -day struggles? And so for kind of common sense and Thomas Paine, the argument is basically that that America needs to break away and create a government that represents them, that they have a republic. And so people are reading this, right? People are, are seeing this, and, and it's going to help spark that revolution, okay? 
But there are other influences, you know. Besides Thomas Paine, let's talk about some European influences from, from this thing called the Enlightenment. If you remember from 10th grade, the Enlightenment, you've got guys like Jean Locke talking about natural rights. And if, if your government does not protect your natural rights, then you have the right to rebel, right? Um, you have other people, though, too, looking at Montesquieu, right? If you say Montesquieu, you're talking about three branches of government, the system of checks and balances. If that sounds familiar, that's the government that our founding fathers will try to create. You also have Voltaire talking about free speech, and Americans are saying, listen, we have the right to speak out against our government, and by golly, we have the right uh, to, to criticize King George over in England. And so these philosophs are coming together and, and of course you even have uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau who's talking about majority rule and so you, you have all of these enlightenment philosophs I guess John Locke's probably the most important one for you to, to really understand because he's saying not only should we have these natural rights we should also have the right to rebel and of course Americans are going to take that quite literally okay so we've got John Locke we've got Montesquieu and lastly we've got Voltaire I guess that's our top three. Within the colonies, this is something I, I probably should do a little bit more with, is something called the Great Awakening. And if you go to college and you take you know, your American history courses, you'll probably spend a lot of time talking about the Great Awakening. For this point, the Great Awakening for us is important in that Americans start to think freely outside of the status quo churches there's a protestant revival it's not it's not a catholic where people are out there preaching in the streets people are out there even women preaching um and and giving religious sermons and while that may not sound like that's important for a revolution what it starts to uncover is that Americans are free thinkers. Americans are standing outside of the established church, you know, say the Anglican church, for example. They are getting their religious liberties, absolutely, but they're also taking a leadership role. And the Great Awakening is just another example where you get this American free thinking independence, you know, like Thomas Paine, like the Enlightenment. We're pushing towards thinking for ourselves and and I think that that is important from an idealist perspective, okay? From a more materialist perspective, we've got mercantilism, okay? If you know imperialism, and I put up this, this slide for that purpose, if you know what imperialism is, right? When a, when a stronger nation takes over a weaker nation for money and power, right? Mercantilism is that, but it's from a very, very economic perspective. Okay, it's the focusing on that money aspect. And so what Britain believed in is the believed in mercantilism. They said, we are the mother country. We are mother England. And our colonies, the 13 colonies, exist to make us a profit. Okay? We want you to export all your raw materials to us. Okay? And as a result, what we will do is we'll take those raw products, you know, let's say cotton, and we will spin it out for you, and we will make manufactured goods, you know, clothing, that will sell right back to you, and we'll keep that link so that England can mark up the prices, and England can control and make a ton of profit from those colonies. So colonies bring over raw materials. The mother country uses those raw materials, which they're buying cheaply, to then make a profit by manufacturing goods and selling them right back to the colonies. And it's this loop where the colonies feel they are forced to trade with the mother country, and prices naturally become pretty unfair. Now, early on, mercantilism is very loose. I wouldn't say that they, they really tighten it down, and so what the colonies colonists do many of them is they engage in a black market trade where they they'll trade on the side with with nations like Spain or Portugal or the, or the Dutch so that they can make a little bit of money for themselves but ultimately mercantilism is a system that is going to make the colonists particularly the merchant class and the land owning class very very angry because England is making this huge profit, and the colonists know that if they can get a little bit of competition between different nations, man, they could make a lot of money. 
but because they're forced to trade with England, England can really control the prices, and this will make us want a revolution from an economic perspective. Okay? Now, from a very idealist lens, America has some taste of representative government. And there are a couple different specific examples that I'd like to point to. The first in 1619 is the Virginia House of Burgesses. Okay, The House of Burgesses will be on your readings exam. And what the House of Burgesses is, is it is a group of colonists that come together, male, white landowners, okay, who can vote and who can even veto laws. Right? The idea is that the House of Burgesses is a way for the colonists to have a voice in their own government. They are now able to, if a law comes to them and they do not like that law, they can strike it down. Right? That's what it means to veto. It means to reject. No more. Okay? The Virginia House of Burgesses is an example where you get colonial self-rule. That's the Regent's language, colonial self-rule. There are other examples, though, maybe one you've heard of, the Mayflower Compact. If you know anything about the pilgrims, they sailed across on the Mayflower, right? And they come to Plymouth Rock and all that kind of stuff. Well, you have white adult male pilgrims who are now voting in what we call a bicameral legislature. Bicameral, bicycle, two. Okay, there are two houses in the legislature. There are two houses that make laws for the people, and the pilgrims are having a voice in that. Okay, again, we're planting seeds where the colonists now feel like they are entitled to having their voices heard in their own government. Right, they have the right to go out and vote on laws. They're experimenting with government, and they're finding out that's really nice to have your own voice heard. Okay. Last but not least, the Fundamental Orders of Connecticut establish a government in which there are three branches. A branch that makes laws, a branch that uh, looks over the laws, uh, reviews the laws, and then another branch that enforces the laws, right? And so these three branches in Connecticut, again, another idea where the colonists have some self-rule. And all of these things should sound familiar because America is eventually going to take all of these things and create a government based around these concepts. They'll sharpen them a little bit, but the ideas are here. This is where it starts, guys. Okay. Now, I, will, I bring up this topic just to show you that while the colonists are creating these governments, not everybody... Uh, agreed with these with these legislatures and it wasn't a, a perfect you know order like in in new england you have these you know town halls but but the town halls they, you know didn't work for everybody right well in virginia that house of burgesses not everyone uh, agreed with some of their 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 laws that were passed in fact a guy um by the name of nathaniel bacon is going to try to overthrow the governor at the time, William Berkeley. He does this because Nathaniel Bacon wants to expand Virginia and the settlers, he wanted to go into to Native American lands. And Berkeley did not want that to happen. Because here's what started to, to ferment. It was the the, the natives, the, the Powhatan tribe would come after the, the colonists and it was this back and forth, you know, revenge game where the colonists would kill some natives, the natives would come back and kill colonists, and it was this, this really messy, messy warfare because the colonists were expanding into Native American land. And so uh, Nathaniel Bacon, he wanted to expand, he wanted to keep going, and so he raises this armed rebellion, he takes over um, and, and, and tries to rule for a while, but uh, even though he's able to take over Jamestown, he dies of disease. And because of that, the rebellion's over, it's crushed. But I, I bring this up just to give you an example where someone tries to, uh, you know, attack an existing order. There is a rebellion here, and that rebellious nature does not go, go unnoticed. That rebellious nature is going to be drawn out uh, come 17, uh, in the 1770s. All right? So, uh, another long-term example 
and, and maybe the most important, or certainly one of them, is salutary neglect. When we talk about mercantilism, right, we talked about it a little bit, this idea that you've got the colonists existing for the mother country. The mother country at the time, England, was going through its own stuff. England was going through what's called the English Civil War. And if you add me for global, you should know something about like Oliver Cromwell, the Commonwealth dictatorship. You should know about the, the restoration where the monarch comes back. And ultimately, you should end with the Glorious Revolution. And the Glorious Revolution, of course, no bloodshed, right? This is this nice transition of power where the, the monarchs pictured on the bottom there, William and Mary, take the throne in England. And William and Mary have to sign the English Bill of Rights. Okay, the English Bill of Rights limits the monarch's power. So there's your like historical context for salutary neglect. While England is going through its civil war, do you think they had time to manage the colonies strictly? Of course not, right? And so during the time of salutary neglect, England is going through its own glorious revolution they they are really putting william and mary on the throne they are focused on getting a bill of rights they're in their own civil war they're not concerned about the colonists and so the colonists are able to adopt a, a policy of self-rule really where they'll cooperate with england um and help them out a little bit but really, what they're doing is they're making money on the side. And they're, they're running things on their own. You know, England is kind of deferring to the colonists saying, okay, you know, you guys take care of yourselves while we're, while we're over here. They're not focused on ruling the colonies. And so salutary neglect is a period where America comes into its own. It feels what it's like to have independence. And once you get that taste of independence, uh, it becomes something that you you want more of right it's like you know your parents let you you know drive the car once and you just go down the you know and park the car down the driveway and you're like man i just want to go down the, the street and they let you go down the street and then eventually you know you want to get on the highway and it's just like this little 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 drift where uh, you know you get a little bit of freedom and you want just a little bit more and that's what the americans are feeling they they want that independence and they like that they're making a lot of money because england relaxes on that mercantilist policy during salutary neglect they don't care as much about the Americans making money on the side, selling to France, selling to Spain, selling on the you know black market. They're all right with that because they're so busy with themselves. Okay, I hope that makes sense. Now, after England is going through its civil war, here's a really, really important and, and maybe the most important cause of the American Revolution. Okay, you must know this. There is something called the French and Indian War in history, and I don't think students have a real good concept of it because even the name of it is very deceptive. The French and Indian War is not a war between France and the Native Americans. Okay, It is not that. What it is is France and many Native American tribes, besides the Iroquois, um, are going to come together. And France has got allies like the Algonquin tribes in Canada. And what they're going to do is France believes that they should have uh, this land, this territory around the Ohio River Valley. And they want to take it. And of course, the colonists are really not in a position where they can defeat France and all of these Native Americans, which, by the way, they've angered quite a bit because they keep encroaching on their territory. And so uh, the British at the time believe that as the mother right, the mother country, they need to go and protect their sons and daughters, right, and the British population, one and a half million, the French population, only 70,000, the French had not colonized quite the same way that the British had, clearly, right, but the French are going to ally with these Native Americans, and they're going to use something called guerrilla warfare, and I hope you remember what guerrilla warfare was from last year, you know, Simon Bolivar was a, was, was a great user of, of guerrilla warfare, Toussaint Louverture, if you think about that. But guerrilla warfare is this hit-and-run strategy, right? You don't fight face-to-face. Um, uh, -face. Instead, you're always moving. You're always, uh, you know, you hit, you move. Uh, the British regulars were known to be uh, very ordered, right? They would move in marches, and uh, of course, they had numbers, right? But the French and, and the Native Americans are really good at this guerrilla warfare style. Now, as the battle wages on, 
and Britain comes to the aid of the colonists. And the colonists help out a little bit, but it's really the British regulars leading this fight. And they believe they're protecting the colonists. They are protecting colonial America by fighting against the French. They decide that they're going to use their navy. And the British Navy do something ingenious. What they do is they cut off French supplies, you know, like a blockade. Okay, and they set up their ships so that the French run out of supplies, and when they do, now it's pretty much easy pickings. Okay, remember this strategy where you blockade your enemy so that they lose supplies. Remember that because it's so important to understand how the, the revolution ends. France will get its revenge. Okay, so the French and Indian War is over, and when the French and Indian War is over, um the British government is going to do a couple of things. First thing is called the Proclamation of 1763. And this is going to anger the colonists so much because here's what it says. It says, you know, we defeated the French and we've got all of this land in the Ohio River Valley. You can't keep expanding colonists. You can't keep moving out there and start in trouble with the natives. You can't do that anymore because we don't want to be over here policing stuff. And so they say, you know those Appalachian Mountains that are really hard to cross anyway? They said, that's the natural border, right? That's the natural border. And so what we want you to do is we want you to back off and stop going across the Appalachian Mountains. We want you to stop going into the Ohio River Valley. We want you to stop making war with those natives. Leave them alone. You got enough land. Stay where you are. Okay? So that's what the British say in the Proclamation of 1763. There's a line. It's called the Appalachian Mountains. And you're not to go past that line. Okay? From the colonist perspective, they're like, how dare you? How dare you tell me what I'm supposed to do over here? You're, you know, thousands of miles away across the ocean, and you're telling me that I can't do what I, my God-given right is, is to expand and go west and, and, and take land? Oh, no, you've overslept Great Britain, okay? And in addition to that, uh, what the British are doing is they're actually leaving some of their soldiers over in America and expecting that the colonists house these soldiers. It's called quartering, where you, you're forced to take in soldiers and uh, you know watch over them, make sure to, to provide a place of lodging for the soldiers. The British are doing that to make sure that, that everything goes smooth after the French and Indian Wars, that there's no more battles, there's no more skirmishes, right, to protect the colonists in, in their opinion, right? Colonists hate that. But they hate this the most. So the British look at this war, the French and Indian War. They said, well, we came over. We spent uh, a lot of money to get our ships across, our supplies, our soldiers. Right, you got to pay soldiers. We lost British men fighting over there to protect you, America, to protect our colonists. We protected our sons and our daughters, right? And so because we did that, we need your help. And I'm not talking that we need you to pay for everything, but we need to help uh, raise some money to pay for this war that we fought on your behalf. And so they start to raise taxes. And they raise taxes because they believe that the colonists should have to pay something for British protection. Okay? From a British perspective, pay your fair share. From an American perspective, are you kidding me? Now you're telling me I can't expand past the Appalachian Mountains, and now you're telling me that I gotta re I gotta pay more taxes to you? And oh, by the way, you didn't even ask me. I have no representation. I can't veto that law that says I gotta pay more in taxes. And so the colonists are so angry, not just because you know taxes are raised, but because they had no ability to stop it. They feel powerless, right? All that independence during salutary neglect that they had, gone, right? They feel like they are the child again. For them, for the Americans, this is going to fuel the revolution so much. This is like the most important cause for you to understand because it brings everything together. And the colonists are going to respond. They're going to respond in a big way. Benny Franklin is going to have a bunch of people come together and sign something called the Albany Plan of Union. 
And basically what it is, is all the colonists are supposed to agree to come together in the face of Great Britain. You know, maybe boycott a couple of, of uh, British goods, right? Come together and, um, and it plants the seed. It plants the idea that if the colonists unite, man, they could be really, really strong. But if they don't, there is going to be uh, that, that, that fracture, that division is going to make them weak. And Britain is going to continue to dominate. And if you've ever seen this political cartoon here, this join or die political cartoon, it is that idea. It is that concept. The different um, uh, states, the different colonies, right? They're not states yet. But the different colonies divided are weak. But together, they are strong like the serpent, right? They are powerful together. And so uh, in class, I have students go through and we'll talk about symbols and things. But just suffice it to say, you need to know the message. The message is that united together, America, united together, the colonists, right, are very, very powerful together. And they need to organize. They need to join together. And that's what Benjamin Franklin tries to do with the Albany Plan of Union. It doesn't work. They're not quite ready uh, for revolution just yet. There's going to need to be a couple more incidents. There's going to be some more propaganda to get this going. Um, just a little note about the snake, very superstitious. During Franklin's era, there was a myth that if you severed a snake, um, it would come back together, that the pieces would like join together, um, or could. All right, so now let's talk about some more immediate stuff. If, if that is all, you know, salutary neglect, mercantilism, the French and Indian War, if we consider those to be um, the Proclamation of 1763, if they're all the long-term causes, I want you to, to know a couple of short-term causes. And I guess most people just start here, but now you've got the background. Let's talk about some of the short-term stuff. So I talked about quartering before. There's going to be a, an act passed called the Quartering Act. And basically what it says is that, you know, the colonists are getting a little bit unruly, um, and Britain is taking some time to get their, co their, their soldiers, their redcoats, out of the colonies and back to Britain. It's taking a process. So along the way, the British are like, well, can you colonists? We, we need you to house some of our soldiers. And it's supposed to be a temporary thing. It's not supposed to be this big deal. Um, it's this idea that you, know, you hold on to our soldiers while we're getting them out. And along the way, those soldiers will, will provide you protection anyway. Uh, and it'll be a win-win for everybody. And from the colonists' perspective, are you kidding me? You're telling me I have to take in these soldiers, these dirty, you know, soldiers and feed them and house them and get out of here. You have no right. And again, Britain didn't ask the colonists if they could do this. The colonists didn't get a vote in this. And so again, they feel slighted by the British government. They have no voice. This one hits those merchants and those landowners very, very hard. And it is called the Stamp Act, okay? The Act taxes anything that was printed, okay? So if you were going to ship anything around, if you were going to make any money as a merchant, you had to put this stamp on your goods, okay? This is a direct tax right on to the colonists. They are paying a tax in which they could not vote against, and they are paying a tax in which if they want to do business, if they want to make money, they got to give some of them some money to Parliament. They got to give some money to the British. And they are so angry at this tax. Meanwhile, the British say, well, you know, this is the cost of doing business, right? This is just the cost that we need you to help, um, you know, pay for that war, the French and Indian War. You need to contribute a little. And after the Stamp Act is passed, this is in a way where the colonists can finally say, you know, enough's enough. We need to organize. We need to fight back. And so the Sons of Liberty form. And historians, you know, debate the Sons of Liberties quite heavily because you know, the Sons of Liberties, they start out um, and engage in some highly, highly controversial actions. For example, they're out there uh, tarring and feathering 
British officials or loyalists, right? And tarring and feathering, it hurts. <laughs> it's not nice to do to somebody, right? Um, and they're trying to make examples of people. They're going to, to merchants who are trading with the British and they're saying, listen, you, you don't do that, right? They're pressuring these people to, to organize boycotts. And so from, from multiple perspectives here is what I'm trying to do. On the one hand, the Sons of Liberty, they're champions of freedom. They're, they're the organizers. And eventually they're gonna create committees of correspondence and get us organized for the revolution. And that's great. But on the other side, you gotta understand, some people saw these guys as terrorists. They're walking around, they're, they're intimidating people, they're telling people you know, what to do. And, and, and some people, particularly if you're a loyalist or a British person, that's, that's from their perspective, that's what they're looking at with the Sons of Liberty. They're saying these guys are, are, are terrorists, right? So just, a, just an interesting way to look at, at the uh, American Revolution. Um, and many of the Sons of Liberty not only create the committees of correspondence, which are necessary and needed to, to organize our, our new nation, but they're also going to become the Continental Army. Okay, And the Continental Army, George Washington's going to end up leading, and that is, is crucial for us because these guys are going to fight for our freedom. They're going to fight for, for, for liberty. Okay, And you even have a segment called the Daughters of Liberty, and the Daughters of Liberty get together to enforce those boycotts. And I guess I should say, you know, what is a boycott? A boycott is when you, when you specifically do not buy a certain good. In this case, British goods. You're not going to buy British clothes. You're going to try to spin your own, right? You're not going to um, buy that British tea because uh, you don't want any of your hard-earned money going to the British. And the idea is to hurt Britain economically, right? In addition to the tarring and feathering, okay? Hit them economically. Hit them where it really hurts. Okay. Britain responds pretty hard with the Townshend Acts. And what they do is they put a tax on anything that's imported from Great Britain. And if you understand mercantilism, then you understand why this really hurts, okay? America is forced under the mercantilist idea this is no more salutary neglect right they are forced to buy from britain all manufactured goods must be bought from britain unless you're buying black market and they're british are, are really cracking down on that now everything you buy goes up everything right because everything is taxed now Okay, and so everything you're buying from the British, you have to buy to live, right? If you're not living off your, your land, you know, as, as much as you'd like, now your bottom line is, is just that little bit lower, and people are so outraged by the Townshend Acts. So the Massachusetts Colonial Assembly, remember those town hall meetings up in New England are getting fiery, they're getting furious, and so the Massachusetts Colonial Assembly says, Colonists, don't pay those taxes. Colonists, you, you know, if you're going to go out there um, and, and buy goods, you're not to pay those taxes. And they're out there, they're, they're writing circulars, writing little letters and in newspapers, encouraging the, the colonists to bind together and stop paying those taxes. And of course, the British respond um, and disband that colonial assembly. So, Here's an event that you probably know um, a little bit about. British are going to send soldiers into Boston. Boston was a city where there was a lot of uh, the, the rebellious literature coming out. Sons of Liberty, very active there. You know, you got to think um, Sam Adams, John Adams, all those guys, right? They're coming together, and the British are out, and they've got their soldiers, and there's a crowd, and there's conflicting reports as to what happens. Um, the soldiers are heckled, you know, they're, you know, people are calling them names and things like that. Somebody says that maybe a snowball with some rocks is thrown. Um, point is, is that one of the soldiers said that they were hit with something and the soldiers start to fire. Eleven colonists are shot, five are dead. And most of the soldiers are not convicted. And if they are, they're convicted on manslaughter. And an interesting fact about this is that a lot of the soldiers were represented by future President John Adams, okay? So just a you know wacky way that history kind of winds together. But this is an example where the colonists latch on. After this event, they call it the Boston Massacre, 1770. And after this event, the Patriots, 
the colonists, right, band together, and they use this as what we call propaganda. They show these characters, they show uh, this this uh, this this picture to people and say, "This is what the British are about. This is why we need to band together. This is why you need to." fight for your rights. This is why you should stop paying those taxes. Let's band together. Let's join together. Okay. So after the Boston Massacre, you get some committees of correspondence. Many of the Sons of Liberty are organizing these things. And what the committees of correspondence do is they uh, organize cooperation between different colonial governments, between the colonies, so that Massachusetts, New York, and Connecticut are working together in some meaningful way, organizing, talking with each other, starting to think about what should government look like? And how should we organize uh, to fight against Great Britain? That is central to understanding the American Revolution is now you've got people who are actually talking amongst the colonies and you're getting some unity. And unity is so powerful. Think back to the, the the Benjamin Franklin cartoon, right? If they can unify, they can talk together, right? They could be that serpent. They could be strong. Now, that organization, those sons of liberty, come together and do something famous, right? The British government is going to place another tax on tea. And the colonists say enough's enough. And the Sons of Liberty join together at night, right? They've got their, their Native American um, costumes on. And they come together and they go to the Boston Harbor and they dump about a million dollars worth of tea into the harbor. And when they do that, it is not only going to hurt them economically, for sure. It's going to hurt Britain economically. But this is a, a real um, slight at Great Britain because, you know, the British are known for their tea. They love their tea, right? And they dump it right into the harbor, okay? And for, for many British people, it's like, oh my gosh, these colonists, they just don't stop. They don't understand anything but uh, fury. They're not going to understand um, that they are these sons and daughters. They are, they are subservient to the mother country, right? They must not get it. And so the British, they start to go pretty hard on the colonists. They respond with something called the Intolerable Acts. Okay, that should say 1774, by the way. Sorry about that. And what it does is it represents, um, they, they get rid of that local government. You know, remember the, the House of Burgesses, the, the Colonial Town Assemblies, the um, Mayflower Compact, all those, those early ideas of colonial representation. They're going to limit that. And they're going to put British officials in charge of local government. It is the British who are going to organize, the British who are going to rule the colonies because I guess those colonists don't understand how good they had it. And they're going to close the port of Boston. And they're going to say, you're not shipping anything out. You're not making any money. If you want to destroy our tea, you won't make any money now. Because we're not going to open that harbor up until you repay all of the money that you cost us for dumping that tea in the harbor. Okay. Again, this is just Britain trying to be tough tough, tough, and the colonists just feel squeezed, squeezed, and squeezed. And uh, oh, by the way, British soldiers can now take colonists' homes if they need to use them for, for going after these Sons of Liberty uh, groups, okay? Things are starting to get bad in the colonies, and uh, both sides now are really, the, the, the tension, you can just like feel it now in the colonies by 1774. And there's a famous quote here by a guy by the name of Patrick Henry who organizes and helps to organize the First Continental Congress where those, those colonies come together and they say this, um, they say we are going to unify against the tyranny of Great Britain, all those taxes, all these intolerable acts telling us what to do and when to do and how to do. They said enough is enough. And Patrick Henry famously says, give me liberty or give me death as though this is the final moment where America needs to form, America needs to fight back and fight to the last man, okay? 
and uh, they elect George Washington to become the general of the Continental Army. And just a little bit about George. George Washington was fighting over in the French and Indian War. He was fighting alongside the British regulars, and he saw the, the way that the French and the natives fought, and he picked up a little bit of that along the way. He, he was very experienced, understood how, how that hit-and-run strategy worked, but also understand how a army is constructed, how a military is constructed, the order, the regulation needed to have a well-disciplined army. And I think that was critical to Washington's early success. By 1775, you get some real fighting going on. And so... Uh, the Redcoats, the British, uh, and the Loyalists, people who are loyal to Britain, want to take some ammo and some supplies uh, from a place called Lexington, and they want to bring them back to Boston, because that's where the, the presence of the Redcoats had finally came. After you know the, the Boston Tea Party, Britain really stepped up its, its amount of soldiers in Boston. And so they wanted to take their ammo and their, their, their supplies back to Boston so they could organize and they could have their military be very powerful. And so as the British are marching, what starts to happen is the Americans, they've organized, right? The committees of correspondence, they're, they're working. And so the Americans were famous for what they call Minutemen. And the Minutemen, what they did is they were very quick. They were fast, right? They were able to, you know, get ready in a minute, okay? And they prepared so quickly. And what they would do is they'd use this guerrilla warfare, that hit-and-run strategy. And they hit and they ran all along the British route to try to slow down the British and try to fight back so that the British did not get those supplies. And you get this famous moment in American history, right, where, where Paul Revere's on his horse and he's running out there and he's, he's going as fast as he can. He's saying, the British are coming, the British are coming. And he's warning the, the colonists. He's warning the Minutemen, get ready. We're going to fight back. We're going to take it to Britain um, and really try to, try to stand up for us. 200 Redcoats killed or wounded during this conflict. And this is the start. Okay, this is the start of something big. Here you got your Minutemen over on your left hand side, and you got your Redcoats over on your right hand side there. Things are heating up in the colonies. Okay. And um, as a sidebar to all of this, I usually spend some time with Benedict Arnold, and, and you'll have to come to class for this one, but essentially, men like Benedict Arnold. Um, I'm going to try to weave him into our, into our campaign, into our story as we go along. But he will be instrumental in the, the colonists' early victories and the Continental Army's early victories because Benedict Arnold is going to become a master of that guerrilla warfare strategy. Okay, so um, let's start with Fort Ticonderoga in the north. The Continental Army is able to, after the battles of Lexington and Concord, they realize that the key concept, key idea in this revolution is to be able to have some bullets for your army. And, and we don't really have a lot of factories, so let's go take what the, what the British have. And so Benedict Arnold is able to uh, skillfully take over Fort Ticonderoga. And when he does that, we are able to uh, get enough ammo, get enough supplies for our people, for our Continental Army. And at this point, Benedict Arnold is rising through the ranks quite a bit. Now, the, the Redcoats will battle against the Continental Army in what's called uh, the Battle of Bunker Hill. And at Bunker Hill, I want you to know, we lose this conflict. Right. Uh, famously, you know, don't fire until the whites of until you see the whites of their eyes. Right. Comes out of this conflict. The, the colonists are on the top of the hill. The redcoats charge. They fire and fire and fire. And ultimately, the redcoats win. They are able to defeat, and the colonists have to run. But but here's the point: the colonists didn't realize how powerful they were. They didn't realize that they could hit the British really, really, really hard and push them to near defeat. And so the Battle of Bunker Hill, for, for the Americans, for the colonists, it's like, this is our, we got a chance. We, we, if we fight the right way, man, we can win. And, and the Battle of Bunker Hill is more of a, um, uh, maybe, maybe just like a, a victory of the spirit in some ways, but certainly a loss down on the, you know, win-loss column, okay? So a moral victory, I guess. Don't fire until you see the whites of their eyes. 
And after the Battle of Bunker Hill, we're going to get some action by Thomas Jefferson. Um, Thomas Jefferson, many of the founding fathers come together and they sign something called the Declaration of Independence. And we talk about it a lot in class, but essentially the, the bullet points here, there's the concept of natural rights. Think to John Locke, right? All people have the, the certain unalienable rights, okay? There is this concept of independence and, and the right to a Republican democracy. Not where everybody votes, but where, where people vote for someone to represent them, okay? More of a Roman-style government than it ever was a, a Greek-style government, okay? And Thomas Jefferson, when he signs the Declaration of Independence, he's writing it, it's a list of grievances. It's a list of, these are the reasons why we can no longer tolerate you, Great Britain. And here is what everyone is entitled to. And here's what our government is going to become. It is the most famous breakup letter, right, in all of history. So, after the Declaration of Independence, there is a back and forth between Washington and between uh, the Redcoats, particularly William Howe. And William Howe decides that he is going to try to uh, cut off Washington. And it is this moment where history is like, it's just so fascinating because it's like a what if here. But uh, William Howe comes into New York and he fights Washington at the Battle of Brooklyn. And he, Washington is, is outclassed in this battle. Uh, Howe has him running. Howe defeats Washington. It's not even close, right? And if, if Howe had kept going at Washington, if he had just been a little bit more, um, uh, a little bit more perseverance in this battle and, and a little bit less arrogance, maybe, William Howe could have defeated Washington and could have sent the colonists, um, you know, in a state of disarray, could have captured Washington. It, it would have been really, really bad had he just finished him off, but he didn't, okay? Defeated him, for sure, but he didn't finish him off. He let Washington escape. And uh, Washington famously escapes through the fog. And I believe that this was a huge mistake for the Redcoats because they had Washington. They had the Continental Army's general, right? You take care of the general. Boom, this war, it's probably over. But he let him escape. And Washington is going to uh, cross the Delaware River famously. He defeats the, the group of German mercenaries called the Hessians along the way. Uh, you know, and that gives them a little bit more morale because the Hessians were known for the brutality, and so the propaganda machine of, of the early colonial governments was able to say, look at what these Hessians are doing. We've got we've to fight. Everyone's got to fight together uh, to avoid the Hessians, to avoid these awful mercenaries coming in and, and doing some terrible things to our people. And Washington is going to stay in Valley Forge for a while. And it was in Valley Forge where a third of his forces had no shoes or coats. It's brutal winter time, right? These guys are freezing. And George Washington says, we need to hold out. George says, we need to hang on. And while George Washington is hanging on in Valley Forge, by 1777 in Saratoga, New York, Benedict Arnold steps up yet again. First in Fort Ticonderoga, he's able to take on some supplies for the, for the Continental Army. Now, uh, he's able to defeat the British and use sniping to his advantage. He's got riflemen who are outside of the battle area, right? Far enough away, and they're taking shots at the British regulars, okay? And Benedict Arnold, through this use of sniping, right? He's the first camper. He's the OG camp, right? Benedict Arnold is able to uh, help the Continental Army defeat the Redcoats at the Battle of Saratoga. And for us, for the colonists, this is a turning point. This is where things are going to start to get bad for the Redcoats. And the British, when they are defeated at Saratoga, they have to push south. Part of that was a strategy on the part of the Redcoats. They believed that, that there were more loyalists in the south, and so they felt like they could get more support down there. And if they could get more support in the south, well, maybe they could, they could organize and push north slowly but surely. Here's what the colonists are doing. As the British push south, okay, the Americans send Benjamin Franklin over to France. Here's why that's important, okay? France, Britain don't get along. Think French and Indian War, right? Okay. Um, 
you know, there's also that, that England's a Protestant nation and France is a Catholic nation. Again, another reason why they just don't get along, you know, oil and, and water, right? And so, Benny Frank comes up to Louis the Fourteenth, and he says, listen, Louis, Louis with the good hair, you know, Louis, son, king, Louis, I am the state. He says, please, we need your help. We need your help in getting back at your enemy, Britain. And, uh, oh, just listen, hear me out. He says, uh, we have defeated the British at Saratoga. We can win this thing. We just need a couple of ships, a little bit more supplies, some, some extra soldiers, like, and you can handle that because your army is huge. You are an absolute monarch king, right? You can do this and get back at those guys. And oh, by the way, we'll be a great trading partner for you, and, uh, and you can help us in our battle against your enemy. And Louis XIV is like, let's do it. It'll take him a little bit of time to organize, you know, like four years or something like that. But Louis XIV is getting his ships prepared, getting his army prepared, and he's going to send it out. But it takes time, guys. It takes a lot of time, okay? So kind of this is like their trump card. This is their ace in the hole that they're putting off to the side. The colonists are. And eventually, eventually, France is going to come up big, but not yet. So hopefully you remember Louis XIV. If you don't, you just... Uh, Look at a couple of these memes, and I think you'll remember. Okay. So, as the British come to the south, hoping to gain support, hoping to gain some loyalist following, um, they are also going to try to cripple the colonists economically. Part of part of the reason why the south is so important to to the to the British and to the colonists is that that's where the cotton's grown, right? And so the cotton plantations are are, are making um, lots of money, and that money is channeled to buy the things that the colonists need, right? The the, the bullets, the guns, etc. So for the British, if they can control that, they can totally, totally destroy the the colonist plan because now they don't got any money to fight the war, and so it's a brilliant strategy, really, if you think about it. But here's the problem. The French start, you know, sending a couple ships just to make things hard for the British. And then the, the Spanish are like, hmm, you know, we have land in Florida. Maybe we can take a little bit more land. Let's let's start messing with these these British a little bit. Um, and then and then the Dutch, who famous pirateers throughout this whole whole thing, are are going to try to take advantage of the British ships, and it's like a feeding frenzy, uh, sort of like a, a mini world war in a way where, where these, these nations are all kind of coming after each other and Britain's having to deal with the French, the Spanish, the Dutch, and that weakens them because they don't know where to be because now they're, they're fighting the colonists, but they've got all these other nations that are trying to, to take a piece of Great Britain and try to take a shot on Great Britain. And so um, that's going to be super helpful for the colonists because otherwise things weren't looking so good. And as Britain is trying to deal with all of the problems it's created, uh, they sent a guy by the name of Lord Cornwallis. And Cornwallis, uh, victorious against the, the colonists in the south early on, but by the Battle of Yorktown, he is unable to keep that success going. It is famous that Washington is able to defeat defeat Cornwallis at the Battle of Yorktown. This is like our, our, our final battle, but he doesn't do it just because, uh, you know, colonists are better than Redcoats. That's not it, okay? Remember that trump card? Remember that ace in the hole? The French come in. And what the French do is they use that old strategy coming way back from the French and Indian War, okay? That blockade that the British had done to the French. They give them a taste of their own medicine, and the French come in and they blockade the British. So the British think that they're able to get some help. In fact, um, what, what Cornwallis was hoping for is that General Howe and a couple of his other generals would come in and give him some support. That did not happen. Because that did not happen, Cornwallis didn't have the supplies, and he didn't have the 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 troops uh, behind him that he thought he was going to have and so that blockade comes back to bite the British and in the end the British are forced to surrender at the Treaty of Paris okay and here's the basics of what happened okay colonists 
they are granted the land east of the Mississippi River. Okay. Now here's the funny thing. France wasn't at the table to negotiate. <laughs> yeah, it was America. America was doing it all, and they said, oh, yeah, yeah, thanks for the blockade, but, you know, we got business to, to handle here. And so that's going to create some tension. Um, hold on to that tension uh, for a little while. Um, we'll talk about that with the John Adams presidency. But anyway, the point is, is that, that France was not at the negotiation table. The native tribes, of course, are not at the negotiation table either. And, uh, oh, by the way, the colonists had had some help from some of the native tribes as well. So, um you know, here's the natives getting slighted yet again. In fact, they're going to lose a lot of their land afterwards, bit by bit, little by little, but they are going to lose in this. And um, the boundaries between, if you look at from 1775 and then you look at uh, 1783, not a whole lot's changing here. Uh, the difference is, is that the colonists are going to expand into the Appalachian, uh, past the Appalachian Mountains for sure. Um, and, and as a whole, you know, sidebar to this whole thing, you got to understand that African Americans had fought alongside the the the, the colonists um, and alongside the British, but they fought more for the British than they did the colonists. And it wasn't because they didn't believe in you know the Declaration of Independence and didn't want that to happen. Of course, everyone wants you know liberty and and freedom, right? The colonists never promised freedom. It was the British who had said, you know, we're going to promise you freedom. Um, we're going to, to, to emancipate slaves because we've done it in our, in our places already and we want to do it for you. And, and of course, uh, the British that will be the, will get rid of slavery long before the Americans ever do. So, you got your boundaries. Who won? You just got to ask that, right? A cynic will say that the wealthy, property owning white males. And I guess, you know, thinking back to, to who fought this revolution, who, who, who really was hurt by this revolution, it, it was the wealthy, right? They're, they're the ones that are getting crippled by those taxes that they're having to pay, right? Um, and in the end, you, if you wanted to vote in America, right, you had to be property owning, which means you have to have some wealth to you. It means you have to be white and you have to be a male. Okay, those things are all true um, in order to vote in America, and that's where our system is founded, right? If you're able to vote, you have some power, and you're able to have your voices heard. Everybody else in America was not allowed to do that. I also want you to understand that slavery is tightened in the South. Um, you, those cotton plantations that Britain tried to take over... Um, are going to run rampant now. They don't have the Appalachian Mountains as the barrier zone anymore. Now we can expand west, and as you expand west, you can expand your cotton plantations, and the, the cotton can now be traded not just with Britain, guys. It can be traded on the world market because no more mercantilism anymore. So you can start to trade with the French and the Spanish and the Dutch, and you can start to take you know the highest bidder. And so they're going to make a lot of money, and slavery is going to be tightened as a result because the Southerners are going to use slavery to decrease their bottom line so they don't have to uh you know pay for labor and therefore all that profit's coming to them okay so slavery is going to increase as a result of this this revolution the american indians are their sovereignty their right to 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 be free uh is taken from them they have to give up their land they don't get to play the game where where they can appeal to the British um, for for help, and the British can come in and say, "Colonists, you can't take this land." You know, Proclamation of 1763, you can't go past the Appalachian Mountains, give these American Indians their land. Now, it's the American Indians and the colonists, and that's it, right? Some in American Indians are going to try to 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 buddy up with some of the French in Canada, but but guys, it's not looking good. With American Indians, okay, and we will see and we will track that the American Indians are going to lose their land and lose their sovereignty bit by bit, and they really don't have much of a choice. Uh, those daughters of liberty that I talked about, they're going to be forgotten. Um, it's it's one of those things where you know the daughters of liberty instrumental in helping to organize those boycotts, but that new government does not recognize uh, the daughters of liberty by giving them you know the voting power. Right, we're not going to see that until until 1919. Right, so 
with that, and I'm sure there's you know a million effects and a million things that I left out, right? But but my point here is to get you the basic causes to to give you some effects that you can think about um, long term. And I think that for those of you that got to write a research paper for me, some things to consider would be you know was this revolution caused by more idealist uh, causes? You know the Thomas Paine common sense. Um, or was it caused more by, by materialist causes, for example, the mercantilist philosophy? You know, where do we stand on this? You know, how was it caused? And ultimately, uh, another great research topic is, is, did anything really change with the American Revolution? Certainly, there's no king anymore, but, but how much really, really changed? Was this quite the revolution that, that, that we uh, maybe maybe you're taught early on in our in our education that it was um, or is this more akin to the to the Russian and French Revolution where you get where you get certainly some change but but maybe just a, you know a slight differences right so things to consider I want you to be thinking about this I want you to take a unique take on that American Revolution um, but at the very least I hope that it helps you gain uh, some understanding of where we have come from and where we have gone um, Thanks for watching and have a great day, guys.